great pleasure for me to welcome you all. Just because this is the start of our classical music series at the French Institute, and this is a special evening because we have the great pleasure to welcome Hélène Grimaud for this talk. And uh, I hope um, we are going to do many um, classical music events, and I hope to welcome you again here. Um, I use this occasion to thank our um, great benefactors, and thanks to them, we are able to organize these events. And I also wanted to thank Hélène Grimaud very deeply, just because she's a great pianist, but she's also a very interesting character, a great woman. She writes books, and she has a very um, full life, uh, full of passion. She plays the piano very well, <laughs> that's the least we can say, but um, also she, she's very involved in what she does, and she does not do anything without deeply thinking that it's the right thing to do. So um, she will be with us in a few seconds, and she will be interviewed by Jessica Dutchen, that I'm thanking as well. And so please give them a warm welcome. And Hélène will be signing some books and CDs after the talk. So please join us uh, then. Thank you so much. My very great pleasure to be here this evening to interview us wonderful pianist, Helen Crimo, in this inaugural event of the series at my very dearly beloved Institut Francais, where you may not be able to tell from my French that I used to come to French classes. Um, Hélène, you were born in Aix-en-Provence, and you studied first there and in Marseille, and then you were accepted into the Paris Conservatoire at the tender age of 13. It's a very, very young age for a musician to start such serious training. Um, how, how do you feel about going off to college at that sort of age now, when you look back on it? Well, first of all, I feel very lucky that my parents allowed me to do so. Because I was an only child, they could have easily said, OK, you stay here until you get your baccalaureate, and then when you're 18, if you still are into this, you can, you can then go to Paris. So I thought it was a very generous, you know, magnanimous thing to do mm -hmm. from, from their end. For me, it was a big adventure. I was so looking forward to learning more. I was just completely hungry for, for more musical knowledge. And of course, the excitement of the unknown, that played also a big part. And then you made your first recording at the age of 15. Yes. And not very long after that, um, Daniel Barenboim heard you, I, I think, playing on the, in a radio broadcast. That's right, I had done a live, well, a recital from the X Festival, and uh, which was recorded and, and, and broadcast live. And, and he heard that, yes. Mm, so this was one of your, your first great breakthroughs into the profession when Baron Boyne invited you to play with the Orchestre de Paris? Yes. yes. So nothing understand. like starting at the top. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because many people of, of my generation didn't go through the, you know, the, the path of international competitions. Most of us, be it, I don't know, Kissin, Le Fauve Anseness, but many others as well, um, started with either a recording contract or somehow uh, an audition with the conductor, which then led to engagements. And um, so it's, I mean, it's just as good a way as any, probably actually better. I think being championed by such musicians as, well, not any bound by, but Guidon Kramer, Marta Argerich, Dmitry Bashkirov, the, these people were really your mentors, weren't they? Yes, I was, I was very lucky to have their, their support and and um, I would say inspiration more than influence, but just being in there at their, you know, in their vicinity and, and watching them work and playing for them, um, that was of course a wonderful sort of opening of my horizons. Yeah. Uh, um, eventually, you, you've come to a, a new-ish, relatively new, let's say, recording home of Deutsche Grammophon, and you've been through a number of different labels before then. Um, I thought this might be a good moment just to introduce um, your new CD. It's a, a wonderful recital programme where you've drawn together um, four very different composers. And the order is Mozart, A minor sonata, the Berg solo piano sonata, Opus 1, the Liszt B minor sonata, and Bartok Romanian dancers. And um, 
I, I find it, I mean, we'll talk more about this in a moment, but I find it very interesting that in such diverse Central European music, you found almost a, a, a sort of common aesthetic that runs along the, the very baseline of the subconscious of this music. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. I mean, it's, of course, as with any program like this, the, the, you know, the latest one is always um, the one you feel closest to. Um, but it's something which started a long, long time ago. I mean, the idea that the, and I would say just as much sentimental starting point for the program as much as conceptual was the Berg Sonata, which I discovered at age 11. And uh, I didn't take the piece very far at the time, but I knew somehow I would do something around that piece. And uh, so many, many years later, the time came. And so this program began with, with Berg. Then immediately the, the sort of logical counterpoint, companion to the Berg Sonata had to be list. Um, that was, I don't know, for me it seemed like a, uh, something absolutely evident, something that had to be, to be so. And then came this, this um, thought of a sort of you know, musical journey alongside the Danube. That was the, the idea, this Austro-Hungarian empire. And even though, of course, um, historically, I mean, historically and geographically, the program goes way beyond the confines of what one thinks of when one thinks of the Austro-Hungarian empire. Nevertheless, um, that was the sort of red, red thread through. What is it that draws you specifically to this type of approach to recording? Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 always been there. I remember in the very very early days when I um, was first recording for Denon, Nikon Colombia. I mean, other than the very first record, um, which was an all Rachmaninoff program, immediately with the second one, where was, I wanted to do Chopin Liszt um, Schumann, which I did. But I remember the first conversation with the producer at that time. We said, oh, "Yeah, it's a little difficult because." We, then we don't know, the retailers don't know where to put the CD if you have so many composers, you know, you know, it's not really clear, it's difficult. Um, and then it has an identity problem and this is not our preference. I was very stubborn already then and I thought, I just thought it was always more interesting to juxtapose either, um, of course, pieces by different composers, but sometimes also with, uh, uh, you know, just one composer on the, on the recording program instead of doing two concertos, for example, to have one concerto and then some sonatas as I, as I did with, with uh, I mean, Beethoven, for example, uh, on a couple of occasions. So that was always something in me. I didn't really even feel that it should be justified somehow, um, but um, but I always felt strongly about it and, and I was lucky that uh, various labels allowed me to do it and it seemed to you know, just be... Just be fine. I think it's interesting when you bring pieces together. They, they, you know, the program tends to take a life of its own, and the pieces have a, you know, they sort of each sheds a different uh, light on the neighbor, and you sometimes come to hear these pieces um, differently in the dramaturgy of the of the program concept. It's not always the case, but it often often is. So you're playing this recital program on quite a, a grand tour at the moment. But how similar or how different do you feel? It's never twice the same. I think one of the greatest danger of, of um, live performance is to try and stick to something which you know and you feel comfortable with because you've done it before, because it's worked before. And that's, um, you know, sort of in a way runs counter the principles of, um, I mean, of invention, of, of artistry. Um, and so you have to anyway leave yourself to be open to whatever the moment is going to bring in the evening. And you are, in any case, I feel subject to that. I think depending, there people have different styles. There are people who are less easily influenced by circumstances, meaning by the acoustics, for example, the instrument, who knows. But um, but by definition, you know, a concert should never be, it should never be twice the same. You should always, and of course, there is a structure for the, for the you know, a vision for the uh, interpretation that you want to do. But uh, in terms of colors, impulses, phrasing, tempo, I mean, to start with, the tempo, for example, is determined by the return of the sound you get. So if you play in a dry hall, you're going to use more pedal, you're going to probably play faster because the sound disappears quicker. So all of these uh, factors definitely um, play a great role in what will come out in the evening. Just as far as I can remember, already as a child, I had clear affinities with the German romantic repertoire, with the Russian composers. 
and um, and so it stayed. And again, there in the beginning, I was I was lucky because I was of course asked a lot of the time to play programs with Debussy, Havel, Fauré. I mean, all wonderful composers. That's not the point. But uh, I always was very very uh, clear for myself uh, about what I needed to do, and uh, and I was uh, I was just lucky that, uh, that I was able to. To sort of assert that, and, um, and this was not you know, never a problem. At the time I was studying, there was no longer a French school to speak of. Most of my teachers had been under the influence of, of Russian professors. Um, they had a much more uh, sort of how say um, you know sort of physically engaged way of relating to the instrument. So it wasn't this this uh, sort of digital. Uh, characteristic, which is often often uh, um, associated with the French school, for example, and and I was just lucky that these teachers had uh, fairly wide horizons. And I mean, for example, I started with you know Brahms exercises and Bach of Microcosmos as one of my first you know things to to achieve on the on the keyboard within the first year and a half, and. Uh, so that I owe to that one individual, and then it was all. I mean, I was just so incredibly lucky because from the first teacher going through, um, you know, Pierre Barbizet, and then the people in the Paris Conservatory, they all they all had um, integrated a lot of elements from what one would call the Russian school or so. So it was it was already beyond those uh, I think those borders at the time. And even if you speak about the Russian school, I mean, it definitely existed at the time. Horowitz and Richter were were. Going on, but you couldn't think of two more different pianists or musicians. So I think at the end, a great school is one which is bringing the individuality of the of the of the student or you know the performer to the surface and actually is encouraging originality and and individuality. But once you give those tools to the students, then the rest is really about about vision and, and expression and originality, and that is. At the end, much more important than you know, sort of a, f a French conception or a Russian conception, because I think this is uh, this is anyway not what you get at the end yeah. with the great people. It's never about that. I mean, of course, there are you know some performances more intense than others, uh, where you're literally transported into another world. Others where you sort of stay there. Um, the ones where you stay there tend to be more draining, and the ones where you're transported are so incredibly. So re-energizing and refreshing that, as you said, you could just start immediately over again, and um, it's um, that's also quite magical in itself. I think. Yeah. Uh, Main obstacles to the well-being of these animals in the wild, where they belong, is human tolerance most of the time. Working also with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, and the IUCN, the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is supervising the, these various range reduction programs and captive breeding programs to put species back out there in parts of their original range. And the fact that the Wolf Conservation Center is involved in, in such a program is, uh, for me, is just an immense source of satisfaction because it's a perfect sort of complement to the educational work if you really put wolves back out there. Um, and it's... Mm, I mean, it's a big responsibility, but it's also wonderful. To, I mean, personally, it's something that, I mean, it's a phase of my life which took a lot of time and energy away from music, from this profession. I wouldn't exchange it for anything in the world. Um, and it personally reconciled me with the human species. I was quite, you know, sort of misanthropically minded before that. And to see all these different people from different walks of life pouring their energies and, and skills into into this project um, was just a great, absolutely great adventure. And also beyond the, the relationship with the animals, which is you know a big story in itself, of course, um, but also the extended family aspect of the organization. I think, unfortunately, that has some, sometimes distracted people from the important point, which was you know beyond the relationship between one person and one animal, which is, I mean, not to be underestimated, it's a fantastic gift. Um, but it's you know the, 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 the most important part of a project like this is the you know the future of the species as a whole. I have a couple of ideas for a third project, but I'm I'm not sure where I'm gonna find the time at the moment. And um, but I think it will happen. Yes, as with Beg, although in a in a much more hands-on sort of way, it's also um, 
a return to, to childhood experiences because as I said, I, I, I learned the piano partly with Bartok Mikrokosmos and of course the Romanian dances, I thought in this, again, Austro-Hungarian sort of idea, which was a, of course a, a period in history which shaped Europe and with all of the, the damages that it left and all of the confusion and, and, um, and pain, I mean, Bartok who of course was around towards the end of that period and I, I thought it was very interesting to choose a piece by him where he chose to reconnect as a source of perhaps not hope but at least comfort with the with the you know music of the earth, music of the people, and um, something very very pure, very direct, um, very colorful, very primal. I don't actively seek uh, different interpretations by different colleagues. I mean, of course, some of them you just have in you because you grow up knowing them. And so, for example, the Liszt Sonata, it's something that I heard by so many different people. And I know so many recordings, even long before I planned on actually playing it myself, I already was familiar with these different approaches. Um, to me, what I find very interesting is if you, if you have a version that you really love, that you relate to, um, what I find it does, and I've discussed it with other colleagues, and they, they tend to, you know, to have the same opinion, the more you love a version, the more you know what you want to do for yourself. So in the end, you're very far away from the version you love the most. It's almost as if the power of, of, uh, of interpretation is really giving you sort of your own, your own wings. So as you hear something, and sort of you, you get this sort of mental counterpoint of what it is you want to do in that passage. And the more inspired it is, and the more convincing it is what you hear, the more it has this effect. So, I mean, personally, I've never been worried. I know many people get asked, well, you know, aren't you afraid that if you like something too much and you listen to it too much that you are going to, even without wanting to, but simply absorb some of the characteristics and tend to you know, regurgitate them, even though they might have first gone through your own filter, but still, but I find that never to be, to be the case. And then there is a very easy way to check that, to actually verify it. Um, this is by putting the version that you've just done next to your favorite one, and it has absolutely nothing to do <laughs> one with the other. So the older the record, usually the more um, the closer I feel to it. And I think also many of us are that way because at that time it was a different aesthetic. I always feel that there is, you know, artistically a, always a, a pendulum sort of movement, and I know personally I always find myself at the sort of opposite end of that movement, um, which is going on at the time. And so I think I always have a, I always feel touched by these older versions. They're much more free, they're much more lyrical, they're much more poetic, they're much more dramatic, they're much less perfect. So you, you come to think that there's always a price to pay for perfection, for control. You end up losing a lot of, a lot of um, expression and originality and um, and it's something that I think we all we all miss at least I think I don't think that you um, should or or um, be playing all sorts of different things at in any given time sort of interchangeably I think if you can do that and maybe you can do it in a very convinc convincing and effective way but um, then I'm not convinced that it's really needed because I always feel that in the choice of repertoire there has to be a sense of there has to be a first of all it has to be essential it has to be something vital to you and uh, always this notion of something inevitable I mean you do it because you can't be without doing it and you can't do it any other way and I don't think that you can honestly be doing that with you know twenty different composers or or pieces yes you do it within the course of a season of course but I think to be selective about the repertoire you do is, is actually a good thing. But of course it depends also on the artist and the temperament and you know, it's very subjective. Okay.